Thank you for joining Jennifer Shops and Associates in our 2019 webinar Wednesday series. We're coming to you live from downtown Washington every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speakers today, you can contact them directly with the contact information you'll see on the last slide. Right, this is just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C. based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This range ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. This is an upcoming event that you can find more information here or on our website. And we do offer advertising, so you can email this email if you'd like more information on that. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today, speakers today are Maria Panicelli and Michael Richard, and they're going to be covering uh, CPARs, what's included, and what if it's wrong. Thank you guys for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Mallory, and uh, thanks to everyone joining us out there. Uh, as Mallory said, today we're going to be talking about CPARs, what's included, and what if it's wrong. Um, the agenda is to talk about CPARs what they are, when they're used, what's included, what a contractor can do when it disagrees with any aspect of the CPARs that it receives. This webinar is part of a two-part series, or I should say part one of a two-part series that we're, we're doing with uh, Jennifer Schaus and Associates. The second part will follow directly after this, and it will deal with some of the advanced rights and remedies contractors have when dealing with unfair CPARs. Um, before we jump in, though, I just want to give a, a brief introduction of who we are and, and how we've kind of gained knowledge in this field. Um, we are uh, two attorneys, myself, Maria Paticelli, and my colleague, Michael Richard, with Obermeyer, Redwin, Maxwell, and Hippel. Um, it's a full-service law firm, but we focus exclusively on federal government contracting. I'm actually the chair of the government contracting group. Uh, as government contract attorneys, we help clients navigate the complex web of rules and regulations governing federal procurement. So relevant to today's presentation, uh, two things that we assist clients with are performance and compliance counseling and dispute resolution, and uh, that includes claims and REAs. So performance counseling is relevant today because it helps us guide clients through issues that come up during the job that can affect the performance. Um, obviously, that therefore affects performance ratings, which is going to be kind of the thrust of what we're talking about. Uh, so we have a, a pretty wide knowledge base of issues that come up and how they can end up impacting your CPARs. Uh, we advise clients on how to deal with and resolve these issues while remaining compliant with the applicable laws, preserving rights, uh, to compensation, um, also preserving rights to other remedies, and finally minimizing conflict with the government. So generally speaking, that's usually a, a good thing. Hopefully it results in the issue being resolved if the contractor uh, you know, is able to do that and get a good performance rating. If not, though, we're going to talk in the second part, in the second webinar this, after, or the second webinar this afternoon starting at 1.30, about some advanced rights and remedies. So with that, next slide. Going to dive into the CPAR system itself. So, first things first, dealing with government contracting, everything's always a lot of acronyms and alphabet soup. So, for those of you who are not aware, CPAR stands for Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System. Um, there's actually a CPARS website at CPARS.gov, um, and that incorporates the old system, the Architect Engineer Contract Administration Support System, and the Construction Contractor Appraisal Support System. Uh, and all other government-wide past performance review systems have been merged into CPARS. Uh, CPARS is a system used for rating and scoring contractors with regard to past performance and basically maintaining and storing those scores for future use and consultation. So why is this necessary? Why is it important? Why does past performance matter? Well, we're in an age now where, uh, you know, as the government procures things, there are few, if any, FAR Part 14 procurements. FAR Part 14 or sealed bidding, there are situations where the price is the most important factor, uh, but the rising importance of non-price evaluation factors means that past performance is a major and critical evaluation factor in many, many procurements, if not all. Uh, whether you're dealing with a standalone contract, task order under a GSA schedule, an IDIQ, a GWAC, past performance, meaning what you have done and how well you have done it, is going to be a key consideration in evaluating and comparing offers and determining who gets a contract award. So having the best performance record is really important. FAR uh, Part 42, 1501, um, defines past performance information, says that past performance information is relevant information for future source selection purposes, 
regarding a contractor's actions under previously awarded contractor orders. Um, and that includes contractor's record of conforming to requirements and to standards of good workmanship, forecasting and controlling costs, adherence to schedules, including the administrative aspects of performance, reasonable and cooperative behavior, commitment to customer satisfaction, reporting into databases, integrity, business ethics, business-like concern for the interests of the customer. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is that the regulation itself points back to CPARS and says that the CPARS is the official source of past performance information. In other words, the website itself. Um, for some of you, you might be familiar with the past performance information retrieval system, PIPERS or PEEPERS, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, that data has now been merged into the CPARS system. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're moving away, and as of, I think it's January 19th, I don't think PIPERS is even going to exist anymore. Um, the regulations state that agencies need to monitor their compliance with past performance evaluation requirements and use the CPARS metric tools to measure the quality and timely reporting of past performance information. If you go to the website, it talks about the importance of past performance information when making award decisions. Um, and in terms of what the website itself actually can do or what you can do on the website, if you are a government official, you can objectively evaluate performance review relevant performance and integrity information before making an award, and contractors can comment on your own, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, evaluation, um, and you can review your active performance ratings. Next slide, please. So which contracts are evaluated? When you're dealing with the CPAR system, not every contract is going to be evaluated. Um, past performance are required for some contracts, specifically if you've got a construction contract, of $700,000 or more, or a construction contract that was terminated for default regardless of contract value. Similarly, architect engineer services of uh, contracts of $35,000 or more, or architect engineer services that are terminated for default regardless of contract value. In all of those scenarios, you're going to need an evaluation to be completed. Um, you also, anytime you are over the simplified acquisition threshold, either for the contract or an order, there's going to be a past performance uh, evaluation that needs to be completed. With regard to multiple agency contracts and single agency contracts, uh, agencies shall prepare an evaluation of any contractor performance for each order that exceeds the simplified acquisition threshold when it's placed under a federal supply schedule or under a task order contract or under any other agency acquisition contract like a GWAC. Um, contracts that are written by other agencies but kind of administered by a separate agency, in other words, uh, those unique cases that we seem to be seeing more and more of where people are, um, you know, having multiple agencies involved in one procurement, uh, that's a little bit tricky. Uh, and basically, the way that the, they deal with that is with the exception of federal supply schedule, multiple award contracts, and GWACs, uh, in cases where the requiring activity and the contracting activity are in separate agencies, it's recommended that they work together and figure out one single point of contact to give you these reviews. Uh, note that these, uh, there's no CPARS requirements for classified contracts or contracts issued under the special access programs. However, that doesn't mean that classified or SAT contracts are not are exempt from past performance requirements. It just means they're done in accordance with program security requirements, and usually that means outside of the CPARS system. There are some strange exceptions, like when you're dealing with the Ability One program or if you're dealing with uh, Section 8A direct awards under FAR Part 19. We're not going to go into those today because that's outside the scope of kind of the, the general rules for CPARS, but just know that if you're dealing with those programs, it might, some things might be a little different. Next slide, please. All right, so when are contracts evaluated? Contracts are evaluated annually. Uh, this includes interim evaluations for multiple year contracts, and there's also a final evaluation in the CPARS system. Um, the, the way that this comes about is from FAR 42-1502, and it says that past performance evaluations shall be prepared at least annually. Um, once the contract or order period of performance has been completed, the agency official should enter the ratings and narratives to reflect the contractor's performance during that period. With regard to interim evaluations, um, annual interim evaluations are required uh, under FAR Part 42. So the the CPARS actually has their own kind of guidance system. We're going to talk about that in just a second. That's up on their website. Um, but it says that because evaluations are required at least every 12 months, um, they also have to be done if there is a significant change within the agency. Um, and also, you need to make certain that evaluations are processed timely. An interim evaluation should be started prior to the transfer 
of any assessing official representative or assessing official duties. So if you've got rollover, they should be doing it timely before they roll over to a new employee. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned before that there is some guidance available online. If you go on to the CPARS website, cpars.gov, you will see that there is a section called Guidance up in the menu. You can click and there is a PDF that is from 2018 updated with kind of the, the most recent guidance um, from the government itself. Now, that's not regulatory guidance. In, in other words, that's not the regulations themselves. The regulations that govern, as with most things with government contracting, are the FAR. Um, but this is very helpful. Um, it's written in such a way that it gives instructions more to the government. But if you know what the government is looking for and how the government's going to behave, it allows you to kind of tailor your behavior accordingly. So one of the things that it talks about in addition to when the uh, evaluation should be performed is who performs the evaluation. And what it says is that responsibility for completing quality evaluations in a timely manner rests with the assessing official, which is known as an AO. The AO is going to be designated in accordance with agency policy, so that might differ a bit from agency to agency within the confines of the FAR. Um, it can be a contracting officer, a contracting specialist, an administrative contracting officer, a purchasing agent, a program manager, or the equivalent individual responsible for program, project, or task, job, delivery, order, execution. In some agencies, it's going to possibly mean the performance evaluator, quality assurance evaluator, the requirements indicator, COR, or alternate COR. Federal agencies are responsible for overseeing the implementation and use of these past performance systems. So the AOs and the reviewing officials are normally going to be designated from within a contracting activity or the organization office program that identifies the requirement. Next slide, please. In terms of what standards apply, again, this is guidance taken from the web com um, combined with the FAR. The guidance on the web says that each, excuse me, each evaluation must include detailed and complete statements about the contractor's performance and be based on objective data. Um, notice that that's kind of something that's stressed uh, in the FAR itself too. The evaluation should include a clear non-technical description of the principal purpose of the contractor order. The evaluation should reflect how the contractor performed. It should include clear relevant information that accurately depicts the contractor's performance and be based on objective facts supported by the program and or, uh, I'm sorry, and contract or, or performance data. Uh, the evaluation should be tailored to the contract type, size, content, and complexity of the contractual requirements. Now with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to get into kind of the meat of you know, what we really care about, what is being evaluated. Next slide, please. Thanks, Maria. Um, so as Maria mentioned, my name is Michael Richard. I'm also a government contract attorney here at Elvemeyer. Uh, we deal quite a bit with CPAR, so let me just keep going here. Um, so let's talk about what they're actually evaluating. Well, the FAR has six uh, categories for evaluation. You see the first three here, technical, cost control, schedule, timeliness. Uh, one thing we want to point out is that contractors aren't supposed to be evaluated for cost control on fixed price contracts, which these days is pretty much the majority of contracts, uh, but the contracting officers frequently do so. Um, I've personally challenged them on, on why they evaluate cost control on fixed price contracts, and they've only been able to say that cost control is still an important part of contract administration, uh, even on fixed price contracts. Um, they often use the cost control category as a place to comment on claims. That's not something that they're really supposed to do. Uh, and I want to take a moment to discuss that. The uh, government personnel often see the CPAR system as a place to discourage claims, to push back against contractor, uh, contractor requests, REAs, things like that, um, to hammer the contractor to compel compliance. And yes, I've actually seen an internal email where a contracting officer directed a COR to use the CPAR as a hammer to get the contractor to do what they wanted to do. Um, that's not a legitimate use of the CPAR system. Uh, if there are any government people out there who are listening, I can tell you that uh, I've presented this to a judge before and she was not sympathetic to the use of the CPAR system to coerce compliance. Uh, in that case, the contractor had across the board outstanding ratings uh, and then they filed a claim and a month later they had a new interim rating where everything was unsatisfactory. The judge thought that was an abuse of the CPAR system 
and uh, ruled accordingly, and it wasn't good for the government in that case. So I'd encourage government contracting personnel not to think of the CPAR system as a tool to use against claims, but rather as what it's intended to be, which is a fair and accurate system for uh, assessing contracting performance. Next slide, please. So the remaining three categories, management or business relations, uh, that's pretty straightforward. Small business subcontracting, that's generally only going to be applicable when part when the RFP requires the submission of a subcontracting plan. Most of the time when there's no subcontracting plan, we'll see they'll just enter an NA, which is what they should do. Um, but if you are required to submit a subcontracting plan, it's really important that you keep in mind you're going to be evaluated for your compliance with that plan in the CPAR system. So it may seem like you can put whatever you want in that subcontracting plan and often contract administration personnel from the government don't ever look at it again once you've been awarded the contract and they don't ask you any questions about whether you're complying. But they're going to look at whether you complied when they do the CPAR. So you want to make sure that what you're putting in your subcontracting plan are things that you can actually do. Um, and then in the other category that can cover a lot of different things, we see regulatory compliance uh, more often than almost anything else, um, but also, also things like cost and pricing data, um, suspensions, things like that will turn up there. Next slide, please. So there's one overall evaluation given. Uh, given what I know today about the contractor's ability to perform in accordance with this contract or orders most significant requirements, I would or would not recommend them for similar requirements in the future. Um, this is clearly the most important rating, more so than each of the, any of the individual ratings. Uh, this really, a contractor shouldn't receive a not recommend unless there were serious contractor cause problems on all or most aspects of the job. The government is not supposed to use the CPAR system to de facto debar contractors it doesn't like or if they're government contracting personnel feels that contractor doesn't have enough experience. That's not what this is for. Um, a not recommend can have a very serious impact on a contractor's ability to procure future work, particularly for small business contractors who don't have a long record of past performance. Uh, it, it can be devastating to receive a not recommend. Uh, I actually saw a situation where a COR who did not get along with the contractor's project manager uh, gave a not recommend when all of the other ratings were satisfactory. Um, we had to actually file a claim, which is something we'll get into in our second presentation today. Um, but the CO did actually eventually change the rating in recognition that it wasn't a fair and accurate depiction of the contractor's performance. Next slide, please. So what, before you, we get to claims, which is what we'll talk about in the second presentation, what do you do if it's wrong? What's the basic procedure if you don't agree with what's in the CPARS evaluation. Uh, so under FAR 42.1503D, the contractor should receive a CPAR system generated notification when an evaluation is ready for comment. It's uh, an automatic uh, computer generated thing. It, it, I've never seen one fail to come. Um, I have seen contractors who change their email address during the course of performance, not receive it because it comes to the original email address. So you want to make sure that you keep your contact information consistent during the course of the contract, if at all possible. Um, but you should get that. And then you have 14 days to enter, uh, 14 calendar days to enter your comments to rebut or add additional information. Uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to enter your, your response within those 14 days. Um, what you don't want is uh, to have that go up in the system without your comments on it. Um, contractor comments are limited to 24,000 characters per category. Uh, that's roughly 4,000 words. Um, it, it's almost always enough space to enter an appropriate response. If you're struggling, we recommend focusing on the key facts that rebut the government's evaluation. Less interpretation, more these are the details that you need to know to understand this. Um, what you should never include in your responsive comments are personal attacks or anything that's designed to say this is really a personal problem, even in situations where it really is that the COR had a personal problem like the one I described before, you've got to be very careful. It's counterproductive. It won't generally be credited in future, future procurements. Um, they just won't, future contracting officers who are looking <laughs> at that 
won't look at it and say, oh, well, clearly the government personnel were at fault. They'll assume that the government personnel were doing everything right and that you just are trying to explain away some defect. So we don't recommend personal attacks. We recommend that you accept the substance. Next slide, please. So when you're entering your comments, uh, you then have a chance to say whether or not you concur with the evaluation. Um, if you don't concur with the evaluation, you, you say no and you request a review. Uh, you should always do this in a situation where you're unhappy with the evaluation. If you don't do it, it may hamper your ability to bring a claim in the future to get it changed. Uh, I have seen situations where contractors didn't bother to request a review, and then later on they get rejected for a future procurement on the basis of a bad CPARS, and then they want to fix it, and you've got to file a claim at that point that's much more difficult to get a board or court to be sympathetic if you didn't request the review in the first place. So you should always do it if you have any doubts about what's in there. Um, under FAR 42.1503D, uh, agencies shall provide review for review at a level above the contracting officer to consider disagreements between the parties regarding the evaluation. In practice, uh, it says above the contracting officer, but we often see the situation where the COR is the assessing official, or when it's the VA, the VA they use COTRs or COTARs, uh, contracting officer's technical representative. That's usually the person doing the assessing uh, evaluation. That they're usually the AO. And so when, they're, when you do request a review, you get it from the contracting officer. Um, that's not technically correct, but if the contracting officer fixes the problems, it's not, a pro it's not necessarily a problem. If they do it that way and the contracting officer doesn't change anything and doesn't address any of the defects in the original CPARS evaluation, then that's another basis to claim that they haven't done, that didn't follow the, the procedures in the FAR and that it's not an accurate and fair depiction of your performance on the contract. Next slide, please. So uh, I just want to run through the deadlines for you. Um, the GSA says in the, in the guidance that, that Maria spoke about earlier, if the contractor desires to, a meeting to discuss the evaluation must be requested in writing no later than seven calendar days from the receipt of the evaluation. Um, if you want to talk to them about it, get back to them right away. There shouldn't be any delay. Uh, and then, like I said before, the evaluation will post in the system 14 days after the day of the notification to the contractor, regardless of whether you've entered comments or, concur or concurred. You, if you get a bad CPARS, you do not want that to post without your rebutting comments. So it's, it's absolutely vital you get them entered within 14 days so that it won't appear in the system without your rebuttal. Uh, it will be closed 60 days following the AO evaluation signature date. Um, after that, you can't add any comments. Uh, it's an automatic process, so those 60 days, that's a hard deadline. Uh, we recommend that you act quickly, um, get help drafting your response if you need it, but make it all happen as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. So in closing, what do you do if you've asked for a review and the reviewing official looks at it and says, no, I'm not changing anything here, or doesn't change the material defects in the assessing official's original evaluation? Well, that's when you have to change, turn to the claims process. Um, so that will lead us into our next presentation, which will be CPARS, contractor CPARS claims and remedies, coming up in just a few minutes. And with that, uh, we will conclude. Thank you very much, everyone for uh, your attention today. And you can reach Maria and I uh, at our emails there on the screen. I'm michael.richard at obermeyer.com. Maria is maria.panicelli at obermeyer.com. And there are our phone numbers. Thank you everyone for joining us today and hope to uh, have you in attendance at our next webinar. Thank you, Maria and Michael. I will um, see you guys next webinar. And thank you for presenting today. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.